Greetings. Welcome to Junior Curator Academy, your inside look under the cone. I'm David. And I'm Sophie. Join us at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington to fuel your curiosity, ignite exciting ideas, and discover new ways of being creative. These are the Junior Curator key terms that will be used in this episode of Junior Curator Academy. Parents and teachers are urged to use these key terms in conjunction with the episode to impart lessons that follow Washington State education standards. Please remember the key terms can be accessed at any point during this episode by following the link. Watch and listen with your Junior Curator Scholar and help them identify these words as the episode goes along. We hope you enjoy the show. Today, we are going to learn about artist Nancy Callan and her piece, Captain America Number 2, which is included in the exhibition Transparency, an LGBTQ plus glass art exhibition. Museum of Glass borrowed this exhibition from the National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia. This show has an interesting exhibition title. What does it mean, Jabari? Well, glass is often a transparent material, like window panes and eyeglasses, which means that you can see light and images pass through. Some may also say that transparency is a synonym for being invisible. The material of glass is often used as a metaphor about things that are seen and not seen. Thanks, Jabari. That was fascinating. Now let me make sure I understand. All these artists represented in this show identify as LGBTQ+. And this is the first exhibition showcasing glass art from this community. That's awesome. That is awesome, David. Now the Museum of Glass is part of a movement towards equality of people of all sexual and gender identities. The contemporary art and design world has been a major part of the gay rights movement and history. Art has brought attention to major watershed moments like the Stonewall Riots and Proposition 8, which stated only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. Artists did the important work of making gay rights visible, which eventually led to gay marriage being legal in all 50 states. From artists like Robert Mablethorpe and Andy Warhol, whose work included erotic portraits of men, to artists like Keith Haring, whose work brought awareness and funding to the AIDS pandemic, to groups like Dan, who bring the politics of sexual identity to the center stage. The LGBTQ plus community has helped to shape contemporary art. Artists from this community have work that has dealt with issues of every aspect of life, such as love, sickness, political advocacy, and even death. Some LGBTQ plus artists sexual identity has filtered into their work in a very subtle way, while others have been more overt. While glass art has been largely known for its formal and craft elements, there are artists whose identity politics are vital parts of their practice. It is important to hold space in all museums for everyone. Representation matters. That is why this exhibition is an important one. For additional information on the LGBTQ plus community and art, we recommend starting with these resources. Thank you, Jabari. This is important information to think about. Art is often about personal expression. There are many forms of artistic self-expression. For example, dance, music, theater, painting, and sculpture. People have always needed the arts. Let's look way back in time. We're going to the Franco-Cantabrian region where some of the most fabulous Paleolithic art was produced by early human beings. The Lascaux cave paintings were created about 17,000 years ago. Nobody quite knows why they were painted. There are a number of theories, but we do know one thing, they are remarkable. Those are incredible. People make art for all kinds of reasons, to express spirituality, to protest, to share the beauty of the earth, to advocate for causes like conservation, to express love and grief, and the overall frailty of the human experience. Now for something a little lighter. Let's look at personal expression in a family activity. Flags are commonly used to promote identity, solidarity, and allegiance. You see flags in all parts of the world, identifying countries and states, and in your community, promoting clubs, religions, and showing support for important causes. What would your own personal flag look like? 
What symbols, colors, and designs would you choose to make a visual representation of yourself and showcase your values, attributes, and history? Use materials you have at home to create your own flag design and find a prominent place to display it. That was fun. Let's look at a new piece together. This is really something impressive here. It's called Captain America number two, and it's made by Nancy Callan. She lives and works in Seattle, Washington. This piece is part of the Stinger series. It looks like it has a stinger, like a bee or a wasp. In this exhibition, each artist was asked to compose their own interpretive label. Here's what Nancy had to say. I'm fortunate to be part of a community of artists that is so supportive of me as an LGBTQ person. I've never personally experienced discrimination because of my sexual orientation in this field. Certainly I've had particular challenges as a woman in glass blowing, often working in roles that were traditionally held by men. I've seen a lot of change in this area as more women work professionally in glass but we still have a ways to go. In my travels, I make it a point to involve girls that I meet at schools and conferences so that they will gain confidence and experience. I hope our community can nurture more gay, transgender, and diverse youth as they look for creative career paths in glass and in art. One day, we may move beyond labels, but right now, we still need out role models who demonstrate that it's okay to be your true self. I chose Captain America 2 for this show for several reasons. The Stingers are inspired by cartoon superheroes of my childhood. Figures like Batman and Robin, Wonder Woman, Superman, and Aquaman, who I think was definitely gay. As a kid, I not only thought they were great, I wanted to be them, especially the boy characters. They could fly, they had special powers, and tight costumes with serious muscles. When I make large blown sculptures like this piece, I actually feel a bit like a superhero. It's dangerous and it's hot and it's fast. It's fluid and it's really challenging. And I love that about glass. To me, these sculptures have a slightly dangerous quality because of their extra large scale and the pointy tip. They are pop art glass on steroids. The form of these sculptures, to me, is a kind of unity of male and female qualities. I think of the form as having an androgynous or gender fluid aspect. As much as I enjoy the superhero mythology, I also wanted to flip the script a little bit and explore my own ideas. One thing that really attracted me to this subject is the bold color combinations and graphics. I use a lot of Italian techniques in my work. The technique of Encomo is perfect for creating bands of color with clean edges. So I use that for the rings. And on Captain America, this bullseye pattern calls to mind the shield. I also give the stingers a little lean to create a dynamic attitude, giving them a little bit of a dangerous edge. Designing each piece is like solving a puzzle to get the right color combination that really evokes the character. Of course, Captain America has the iconic red, white, and blue costume. Captain America Stinger is probably the only piece in this series that has a little bit of a political overtone. Anytime we see red, white, and blue, we relate it to our flag as Americans. So what does this weird abstract sculpture have to say about America? I leave that to you, the viewer. What's a superhero? It's a special person who fights evildoers with superpowers and oftentimes wears a special costume. I've seen the movie Captain America. Yeah. Captain America has a long history starting in wartime comic books. The first issue of Captain America was made in 1941. What was happening in 1941? Does anybody know? That's right, you got it. 
World War II. That was a global war that lasted from 1939 to 1945. Captain America is depicted as a hero who represents the strong and courageous American spirit. And here is the cover art that he is shown fighting Adolf Hitler, the leader of the German Nazi nation. You can see the swastika on his uniform. Captain America was not only a comic book, but was also a useful piece of wartime propaganda to encourage everyone to join in the fight against fascism. Captain America is shown wearing a costume inspired by the American flag. Now you all remember the Stars and Stripes teapot from episode one, where we explored how the flag has become assimilated into pop culture. The mythical Captain America fought the Nazis and the Japanese Empire. Indeed, he first appeared just a year before the attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii by Imperial Japanese aircraft. During this attack, 2,403 American soldiers were killed and many ships and planes damaged or destroyed. This action brought the U.S., which had been neutral until that point, into World War II. Captain America has periodically returned to comic books, cartoons, and movies over the decades. It was a big draw during the 1960s when Nancy was young. Captain America was published by a company called Timely Comics, which would later become Marvel Comics. They have created many superheroes and supervillains. The comic book format has a long history. As a medium, the story is told through drawings and a sequence of panels. The medium of comics originates in 18th century Japan, but became very popular in the US and the UK during the early 20th century. The earliest US comic book is The Adventures of Mr. Obadiah Oldbuck, created in 1847. The creation of comic books is guided by a very specific format, which includes drawing, coloring, and writing. What do you think, Sophie? Is it time for you to lead us in another family activity? Yes, and do I have a good one. All of us have many different identities, things about ourselves that make us who we are. Some examples of different types of identities include your gender, race, and other social roles. Here's a chance for you to think about how the identities you have shape your experience of the world. In the style of comic art, think about how you feel when different aspects of yourself are visible to others and how you feel when they are invisible. Then create your own comic strip starring yourself and or your alter ego. This is a great opportunity to express yourself and help others get to know you better at the same time. Have fun. That was a great activity. Hey Sophie, do you have a favorite superhero? I do. My favorite superhero I think is Spider-Man. Why do you admire Spider-Man as a superhero? Peter Parker, whose alias is Spider-Man, is a really relatable teenager when he's bitten by a radioactive spider that incidentally gives him his superpowers. What I really like about Spider-Man is that he's really driven to help his local community and because he recognizes the power he holds and always tries to use that power to benefit others. We all like superheroes. Why is that, Jabari? I think that is a good question. But I'm not the right person to answer that. Let's ask my friend, Dr. Robin Rosenberg. She is an expert on superheroes. Hello, Dr. Rosenberg. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and discussing your talk about what is a superhero. How can one exploring the boundaries and parameters of their difference make them a superhero? I have a, a you know, sort of a theory about superheroes, which is typically first they understand they have some special ability uh, or power, and then they explore the boundaries of it and then learn to control it. Um, and that's the super part. And then somewhere along that process, they have to decide how they want to use those powers. And that determines whether it's a hero, a villain, or just a super person, but not necessarily heroic or villainous. Yeah, when you think about um, Martin Luther King Jr., for instance, uh, he became a hero by exploring his um, boundaries of his difference. In our world, I think there are many people who, in this case, they actually have a calling first. Um, so it's a little different than the superhero arc, where they have a calling and they then have to figure out how to harness, you know, what are their abilities that they can bring to bear? What are the differences, the different perspectives they can bring to bear? Their, their unique talents and abilities as well as more common talents and abilities. And then how to 
really channel those and focus those. I think the another way is the accidental path, which is you kind of fall into something because of chance um, or circumstances, and you're in a situation that you have to rise to. And in that moment, in that sort of set of moments, you then summon something in yourself to be greater than you have been or could or thought you could be. So this, the situations turn us into superheroes. How do these concepts of difference and heroism inform larger ideas of identity, diversity, and the search for equity and inclusion? If, if you know of the character Batman's nemesis, Poison Ivy, from her point of view, she is a, she's acting heroically, you know? And so she thinks that her mission is heroic, right? And so it's a challenge because it's really when people's uh, goals and values clash that we start throwing around, uh, you know, hero and villain, right? Because we're all heroes of our own stories. If, if, if I feel that equity for you comes at a cost for me, then what happens is I have pit us against each other where equity becomes a zero sum game. And then I would view you as the villain and so I think a lot of the dilemma in our society is really how to help people understand that you don't need to do that. That you don't need to pit one person against someone else. That with equity, everybody wins. That with inclusion, everybody wins. We have so much more in common than, than otherwise. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the, the challenge in, in our society, which is how to figure out how to do that. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Rosenberg, so much for joining us. Uh, your insights uh, really helped me to see what a superhero is from a different light and a different context. It was really great, great experience having you here. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure and for such great questions. It's now time for your junior curator assignment. This week, you get to research the origins of superheroes. Here's a starting point. Look up TV Tropes Superhero Origins online. They have 10 listed. After you have studied these and other sources you can find, you get to invent your own superhero. Send us your superhero for us to post with Nancy Callan's piece, Captain America 2, to juniorcurator at museumofglass.org. Remember your superhero is a force for good in the world. What will your superhero do to support humanity right now, in this time and place? What kind of superhero do we need? Before we conclude this episode of Junior Curator Academy, I want to remind everyone that every culture in the world has heroes that resonate through time. In ancient Greek mythology, we have Hercules and Achilles. Quetzalcoatl is part of the Aztec mythology. In Britain, we have King Arthur. There are so many others all around the world, like Kentaro from Japan and Gluskabi from the Abenaki people. I asked community scholar Javon Bird to tell us a little bit about African heroes and heroines in African mythology. Let's hear from Javon. Hello, everyone. My name is Javon Bird, ethnomusicologist and Afrofolklorist. I study West African music, but specifically the Yoruba people of the Southwest region of Nigeria. When thinking about folkloric superheroes, there's just so many I can choose from. Moremi, the Yoruba queen, who was also a warrior. I can think about the Orisha, Yoruba, um, traditional Yoruba deities. There's many kinds. There's Oya, Shango, gods of thunder and lightning, Ogun, the deity of um, iron and war, and also Obadala of wisdom and intelligence. My favorite to talk about is Ogun. Ogun Daji. I will buy the iPhone bomb. Nobody be in your table when you want to come and say, you buy a new phone, more fin phone, more fin share gun. Ogun was seen as the Orisha. When all the Orisha wanted to come from the heavens to the earth, they were figuring out, they wanted to know how would we do it. 
Ogun was the one who used his um, iron, um, who uses iron chain and dropped it from the heavens so all the Orisha can come down and inhabit the, um, the earth. When they came down though, there were thick forests all around and they still were like, okay, who's gonna clear this? Ogun said, I will. And they said, Ogun, you? He said, yes. So Ogun cleared, um, cleared the way and then made it um, habitable for the Orisha and then eventually the humans. Ogun, has always been seen as a symbol of strength and resiliency amongst the Yoruba and even those in the African diaspora. You see Ogun being um, worshipped in, uh, in Cuba, in Brazil, and, see, and seen as a, um, a symbol of strength and of liberation. To this day in Nigeria, there are those in the, um, in the warrior and the hunter societies that are also Ogun worshippers. They actually name themselves they put Ogun at the front of their name. For instance, you might see someone named Ogun Shina, which means Ogun opens my way. Um, Ogun Kimi, Ogun Chade, which means Ogun gives me the crown. Ogun to this day, across uh, the um, African diaspora and Nigeria, represents someone who's extremely strong. People who, when they're, um, when they're feeling weak or when they need energy to like, accomplish a great feat in life, they look to Ogun. The hero who was never defeated in war, the one who opened up the way from the heavens into the earth, and they say, Ogun, watch over me. And I know if you watch over me, Ogun, I can always have the strength and the power to do anything that I think is capable. So to this day, Ogun is not only revered as a deity, but also a symbol of power and strength that lets people know that they can accomplish their greatest dreams as long as they push forward. Thank you, Javon. I love learning about Ogun. Let's hear from Nancy Callan about her favorite superheroes. My inspiration of superheroes is ever-changing. Right now, I'm very inspired by all the people who are working on the front lines, our caregivers, risking their lives to care for others. These are everyday superheroes who need to be celebrated. Someone like AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who stood up for herself by saying she wasn't raised to take abuse by any man. Our heroes are peoples who stand up for their rights and the rights of others. We all must be strong, especially now. We need to move forwards, not backwards. I know this is gonna sound corny, but in all seriousness, we all need to fight for truth, justice, and for America to live up to its ideals. Can't heroes be ordinary people who don't have superpowers but do brave and amazing things for other people in dangerous situations? Yes, David. Here are two stories that I really like. I have rights. I have the right of education. I have the right to play. I have the right to sing. I have the right to talk. I have the right to go to market. I have the right to speak up. She's become the voice for girls around the world. In 2011, CNN interviewed Malala Yousafzai, a Pakistani girl who gained international headlines two years earlier for speaking out for girls' education through a blog she wrote under a pseudonym. When I see my name in the newspaper, I feel that, yeah, God has given uh, this honor to me and I shall accept it. This all happened during clashes on Saturday between Black Lives Matter demonstrators and far-right groups in London. Patrick Hutchinson says he picked the man up after noticing he was injured and carried him to police nearby to keep him safe. Those are some amazing people. Thank you for sharing with us. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Remember to send in your superhero assignment. We cannot wait to see them. Thanks for joining us on Junior Curator Academy, your inside look under the code.